All right, so I'm gonna start over. So here, today we're gonna make plates. So um, we're gonna make this kind of plate that has a flat bottom and has a slight turn and then a rim. We're gonna talk all about that. And then next class, we're gonna trim it. The goal is for all the Ceramics 2 students to make at least four of these before the end of the term. Um, if you're not into throwing or if you wanna experiment, you can also work on slab built plates as well or substitute out. Cause there's a f I think there's at least one student that, that wants to not necessarily throw everything. So that's okay. Um, we're gonna start by doing this today, throw just this and then we'll trim it and put a foot on next time. So there's a couple things that we need to do when we think about plates. First of all is clay. Generally, um, softer clay is better. So in general, I don't use new bag clay because new bag clay is usually really good for throwing more vertical stuff and is a little bit stiffer than clay that has been thrown once before, has, your, has all your throwing water and a little bit blah blah mixed in there. So having that you wedge it up really good, maybe even throw with it twice already, right? And so just save that stuff up and then you can wedge it because it's gonna be a little bit wet. You wedge it up really good and then you save those for plates. So I used to do that a lot. So this is reclaimed clay and this is just mushy stuff. The reason why mushy is okay is because the plate in general just lays flat. Most of it is supported. You're not asking it to go vertical at all. So. Um, mushy is okay. If you don't have mushy clay, um, it just makes it a little bit harder to squash it down against the bat. We'll talk about that. So right here, I'm starting with five and a half pounds. Now for me and what size plate I'm gonna make, this is a lot. So let's explain why that is. Normally we make a plate and that plates in general, when you make them on the wheel, need to be less than a foot wide. Why is that? Or about a foot wide when you initially make them is fine. That's because most we have in here in America, all our cabinets are 12 inches or less depth space above the counter, right? So if you have a plate that ends up being 13 or 14 inches wide, which would be pretty big, right? It won't fit in the above the countertop cabinets. Right. There's a reason for that. That's because the cabinetry is only 12 inches deep because that's the profile wood comes in. Right. So the above cabinets, if most of the stuff we use a lot goes up there. Right. And the stuff we store below the countertop is harder to get to. Now, you may store plates down there, but if you make it 12 inches or less on the wheel, it can go in either place, right? And if you go home and you measure, probably most of the plates you use just because of that are less than 12. So make sure a 12 is a critical thing. Now, if I make it 12 though, remember clay shrinkage is a little bit more than 10%. It's gonna shrink more than an inch. It might be, and it'll be at least probably less than 11, but not everybody's cabinets are 12 inches deep. Sometimes the, the door of the cabinet takes, closes in and takes up some of the space. Sometimes your cabinet's only gonna be 11 inches deep for whatever reason, right? So you go home and measure it because that decides where you can put it. If it has to go underneath, people just in general, at least in my house, because of laziness or whatever, those things down below are harder to get to, right? Because there's so much depth space underneath there right that things get piled up in front behind whatever and that's harder to access right and it's just a human nature thing not a um is it right or is it wrong thing that makes sense so just so like your cups that you use every day are probably above the counter cabinet because that's really easy to get to you, just, whoop, you pull it out two seconds later you're not digging around for your favorite cup down below that makes sense. So plates less than, ideally less than 11 inches when they're done. So if I throw a 12 inch plate, then I'll be good. So the one way we could measure this is we need at least a bat that can fit at least 11 inches, right? So these regular brown bats are about 12 inches wide. You can see that because the zero is there and the 12 is there. I'll put my thumb marks on each one. So you see that? So if in the end, the rim of my plate, the widest point of the plate matches the outside of this, when I'm done, do the shrinkage, blah, 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 it'll be under 11, because it'll shrink a little bit more than 10%, right? If you wanna know exactly about how much it's gonna shrink, every eight inches-ish 
eight and a little, or a little bit more, it shrinks about an inch. So that's the way the math works. So it's gonna shrink more than an inch, maybe an inch and a half. So then I'll just line this baby up. All right, so I'm ready to go. So, and plates, um, it's not something we cover in Ceramics 1, right? Because it requires us to do something a little bit different. So let me put this guy down there. And then let's throw. So um, this is on there. So you always got to throw these on a bat, right? And I like these 11 inches, uh, 12 inch bats because it automatically gives me, I just trim the rim off to match this. And then I got it. I don't have to worry about size. Now, this for me is a little bit big. So I know that to throw an 11 inch plate exactly like this in the end or 12 inch plate, whatever, I only need four, a little bit more than four pounds. I'm starting off with five and a half pounds because that's probably more in your range because I'm really efficient, right, when I throw. Soft clay means that, and then let's go back to the clay hardness, means that I don't have to work too hard at wedging, I don't have to work too hard at centering, and I don't have to work too hard when I smash it out and down, right? So soft clay is better, but in general, I wouldn't want to try to make cups with this softer clay because when I throw it, it has, and I want my cup super thin, I need a little bit of strength there. It's hard for me to throw soft clay up high. If you wanna go really high, like 12 inches high with a cylinder, this clay would not do it because it's too soft. So I'm using reclaimed clay here because that's the softest bag I could find. And right now the drawback of reclaimed clay is that it's reclaimed, it's a mixture of different things. There's an unknown factor here about how the plate's gonna turn out, right? Because there's mixtures of different things. I may find a hunk of plastic in here or whatever during the process. So I would, not, if I was really concentrating on making this something that I wanted forever and I was gonna do this for my grade, I definitely would not use reclaimed clay for this, right? Because I'd be more concerned about the product turning out, right? So here we go. So you see it's in the middle. Now this is slightly bigger than what most people do. So I'm gonna center it by, by slapping it around a little bit. Right, you see, and you see how like I'm able to get it centered. Now, as when I was younger, I could throw anything, right? In my 20s, I was taking ceramics in college, right? I was this very strong, athletic dude. It didn't matter how hard I worked the day before, I could bounce back and I could do it over and over and over again. As I've gotten, and I could throw plates out of hard clay, right? As I've matured and gotten wiser and my body hurts more, right? Softer clay, I see the benefit of softer clay and the ability to work less. I used to really pride myself that I could center anything before, right? So I slapped it down, it's pretty centered. So that's just me being wiser. And then I can really power this into the middle because it's soft, right? You gotta be gentle because you can rip the top off, right? I didn't have to push that hard, right? And I'm actually in a bad throwing position because of the way the video cameras are set up, right? I normally, when I center, I'd be really hunkered in over it, my head to be over, but I'm trying to keep my bald head out of that camera there, right? So I'm trying to keep it away so you guys, trying to throw back and away, right? Like this, so you guys can see it better. So you see that? So that's something I learned when I was doing COVID lessons, right? And then you guys notice I used to wear a beanie a lot in my videos. That's because I, my head, my head would actually end up in camera. So it's like, I gotta figure that out, that's embarrassing. So that's a little story about why I wore the beanie and I should have wore the beanie in today because I have two in my office, but I forgot to wear, bring them over. So you see I'm centering, I'm just coloring it up. All right, so this is normal, right? So now when you're throwing a larger amount of clay and especially when it's softer, right? Because most of you four or five pounds is a little bit outside your range where you're comfortable. Lots of clay is gonna come off on your hands when you do plate. So first of all, when you work with larger amounts of clay, more clay is gonna come off when you're centering and this clay is softer, more clay is gonna come off, right? So bigger pieces of clay, um, your wheel goes slower as well. Don't be panicky about all this clay coming off. It just does, right? So this is feeling centered. So now I'm gonna push down like normal. So I'm at the point where this is all normal, right? As far as there's nothing different from what we were doing before. Now we have to think about how do we get this piece of clay wider, right? So we can end up with something wide like that. So what we have to do is basically 
squash this mound down. So instead of being this kind of dome tall mound, it's like this wide mound that maybe comes out to here and only is maybe like that tall all the way across, like a round slab that's like that thick. So this is going to require me to push down here and I'll just do that push down, right? The issue with just pushing straight down is you can see like this area here is like bubbling out a little. You see how this area is now wider than the section below. Uh, something's up here. I wish we could maybe. Oh, wrong way. You see that how that area there is getting wider. Right, right here, you see how this is bubbling out. If I keep pushing down, this area will keep getting wider and wider and wider. And then what will happen is it will fold over and attach to the wheel and trap a bead of water or a, or a semicircular air pocket down there. And that is death to your plate, right? It will crack in a semicircular crack pattern. So we gotta watch this part, keep it from folding down early. I should have not let this happen yet. So when I'm pushing down here with my hand, I add a little side pressure from my opposite hand. So let's go that way. Oop, it didn't work. What's going on? Okay, so no, none of that. So I'll add a little bit of top pressure here from the side. You guys see that? So here, side pressure as I'm pushing down and I'll push down. Ugh. Right, you see that? How I collared that part in and I moved the kind of thick part down. So whatever I need to do to keep that from folding over. So pressure here and then side pressure here, right? And I want this side clay to kind of squirt outward. That makes sense to everybody. While I'm doing both of these actions, I do not want the clay folding over and trapping air. So I'm also running this pinky right on this hand. I'm running this pinky here along the side down here on the opposite side to keep the clay from folding over. So on this side, on the opposite side here, which is out of camera view, I'm running this pinky along the bottom, right? And keeping it back so this part of the pinky here is pushing against the clay to keep the clay from folding over. And then just by will of force of will, I'm pushing the whole thing and the whole clay is kind of sliding outward. No folding over. So here we go. I'll push down and do that like that. See that how it slides out. So that's why having soft clay is critical, right, for this. So you save up all your old clay. Like if you if you lose something on the wheel, don't you don't have to try to wedge it and reusing it. Make a collection of that and keep using new clay until you have enough to start throwing plates. And that shouldn't, hopefully that doesn't take too long, right? Unless you're really good, right? And nothing, you lose nothing, right? So you see how there I created this flat thing, right? And it is a mound, but it's way too thick. You see that? So I need to keep pushing it outward. So I keep pushing this hand over here, running that hand over there, and I keep pushing down. Like that, you see how it keeps sliding out? Not like that. I'll go again. Hoop. This may take a while. This is where a lot of clay may come off in your hands and not much is coming off on mine, but a lot may come off on yours, right? Especially when you start. So I'm getting there, right? So I'm pretty close, right? Because what am I gonna do? I, I think I want to stop just a little bit shy of this. I don't wanna keep going out to the edge. So why is that? All right, I'm gonna clean that up. I want to just leave this cause I'll throw a little thing here and then fold it over to be the rim. Right, so I don't need this to come all the way out to the edge. That makes sense. So then I'm looking at my thickness. My thickness looks good for what I got. Let's measure it with a needle tool. That's what I forgot to get. I didn't get a needle tool. Give me a second. There. So here, I'm gonna stab it. Let's check the thickness in the middle, right? So when I pull it out, it is about that thick on my needle tool. So let me see if you can see the full needle, let me do that again. So we're in the middle, oh my goodness, it's really thick, right on that needle tool. So, but you can see that this is slightly domed upwards, right, and that's okay. Maybe I'll squish it flat here. So I'm just gonna add more pressure here and squish it flat, right? But you see how much mashing of the clay I have to do, right? That I really gotta take this tall mount and mash it flat. That's where having soft clay really helps. 
Now, if there's any soft clay anywhere, I scrape all that off, right? So I scrape, scrape, scrape using my hand. And then if there's any soft clay here, I scrape that off. You see that how that clay is coming off? Any soft clay that's goopy, right? So now I'm ready to go. Let's back that off a little bit. So now what I'm gonna do is just using my regular mode, I'm just gonna go down and in. Right, just like as if I'm opening a regular thing and then I'm gonna stop with my needle tool, I'm gonna check my depth. Oh my God, I went too skinny. Oh, John. So, so there's a little trick. We can try to mush some clay back. So here, I'm just gonna take some clay and go down a little bit off center and see if I can push that clay back into the middle. This is not a good situation. I wasn't paying attention. So normally if I were working at home, I would just scrap this plate and re-wedge it and go again. So I'm gonna check the depth again, because there's a, now there's a greater risk of that part S cracking later, because I push some clay back into the middle. Let's check, oh, it's okay. So that's getting close to okay. If it's a little bit thinner than what I want, so we're just gonna go with it. Now, to, because it's a little bit thinner there in the middle, instead of raising at that level, I'm actually gonna raise up a little and then open. And then when I smooth it, I'm hoping that that clay will fill back in a little bit. So here I'm gonna just start pulling back a little bit higher. Now, this is the issue that I have, right? This little wave of clay here starts building up and there's a little seam down there, right? So this little wave of clay starts rolling up on itself and can trap a bead of this wet surface between this clay, this wet surface, and then the main body of clay. And then that will pull off later, which is bad. So I need to, that's the other thing I forgot to get was a sponge. So I need a sponge here. And what I'm gonna do is I pull back a little bit and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna suppress this little bead of clay back down onto the thing. Right, you see how that's pushing back, pushing itself back down. And then, so it's now rebonded back and then I will pull it open again. Pull, 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 pull. Until you see it starting to wave up over the top again. And then I'll rebond it back down. This is all, this is kind of awkward to do, but it works. Right now, the reason why I teach it this way is because I'm not teaching you anything new, the opening, the widening, the centering are all the same techniques that we learned before, right? There are other ways to do this, but I don't necessarily want you, wanting you have to learn a new skill, right? So this is exactly the same. Now, I have learned to open with my left hand, to widen with my left hand, and I could push this down at the same time, right? So we'll do this, you see that? So I'm doing both at the same time. Oh, and I'm being super watchful that this area inside is flat. Now, the one thing that you will, oh, ooh, the one thing that you will also notice is that this area, as we get further and further out, the speed of clay whipping around here is really fast. For each revolution, there's a lot of clay. So I need to slow down my wheel speed when I'm doing this. So here, opening, opening, opening. I wanna slow down my wheel speed. Now I might wanna stop here and then work this middle section because it's a little bit bumpity, bumpity, bumpity. So I'll take my, my uh, thing, my sponge and just make sure that's flat if I need to do any alterations, whatever. I can move that clay out to the edge if it's thicker in one spot. That's looking pretty good. And then I now can continue opening and pushing down at the same time. That makes sense, everybody. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Go slowly. Go slower when you get to the outside. Go slower. Slower, 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 slower. So you see now, basically, I made a short cylinder, right? It's just really, it's just all base with a little bit of width. So now what I'll do is I'll just, before you do anything with this side, you want to take care now, once you get this about to the size width that you want, like, the widening, you wanna come back here and make this look beautiful. So I already did part of it, looks pretty good. I'm just gonna come back and finish it. Take my sponge and push, 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 push out to the edge. And then what, I, what I'm really looking for is a flat, even bottom. So how do we, one way we can check is just by using our 
needle tool and push in the middle, check, push here, check, push here, check. Oh, it's actually pretty good, right? That's looking pretty good. It's a little bit thicker out here at the edge. So I'm going to just keep pushing that. I'm just going to suppress that down a little bit more. Ooh, that's feeling really good. So I'm going to do, I'm just going to go one more time from the middle out. Just really try to make it as flat as I can and smooth as I can. Do we take any of these? I'm not pushing very hard, right? So now what I want to do is compress that surface a little bit more. So I'll get a rib that has a flat edge. And remember, I'm going to work from this side over from this side over because that is the side that's spinning away. So here I'll just use my rib like this. Maybe we'll bring this in a little closer like that, like that. And then I'll just go boom from the inside out. So I want that pretty flat, right? And, and pretty even Steven. that makes sense? Anybody have any questions about that part? So what is this doing? This is compressing the bottom, getting any goopy clay out. And so that compression tightens up that surface a little bit and helps add some strength to it. Because since this is, since a plate is most mainly all base, right? Flat, this flat, this is the weakest part of any form that you make, right? So it's the most prone to cracking. So I want to take my time to compress, flatten it out, make it good. All right. So now I'm ready to throw this guy. So this will be like throwing a short little cylinder, right? So I'll get my sponge out and I'll wet the inside and outside. Now, also, again, you need to do an update, kind of check to see if there's any goopy stuff there, right? Any goopy stuff that just comes off from you doing that just needs to come off. Don't try to keep that. Right, so that got, and then degoopify. There could be lots of goop at the rim, degoopify that. Okay, so now I scraped off all the goopiness. I'm gonna wet it down and I throw it like a, like a short cylinder, but I'm gonna go up and out, right? Like the way we make a bowl, I'm gonna let it flare out immediately. And I wanna keep the eve th um, evenness thickness. So you can already see that this, this is pretty even already, right? It's not thicker, but if it was thicker down below, I'd squeeze harder down below and try to thin it out. So here we go. So here, I'm just gonna put my hand on the outside. Now, because this is probably, might be the widest thing you've ever made, right? The, it is really whipping around, right? Speed wise. So for every revolution, there's just a ton more surface area that goes through your fingers. So you want to lower the overall wheel speed so it feels about the same, but that also means that you need to move up slower when you go up, right? Because you need time for that revolution to happen before you move on to the next place. Also, you want to just goopify this whole thing. You want super goopy and slippery. And then here we go. So I'm gonna push. I'm mainly gonna push out from the inside at floor level. Push straight out. And then I go up and I'm gonna let it flare. And because this is flaring, like I'm trying to make it flare out some, I take it easy when I get to the top. I wanna to keep some thickness here because this top has a long ways to fold out. And just the act of me folding this top down is gonna thin it out, right? Cause it needs to stretch out a little, a whole bunch, right? So I wet it down again, wet the inside outside down again. And then each time I'm just gonna let her, I'm thinning it out a little, but I'm mostly concentrating on the flare, right? Making sure it's going outward, right? You see that? So you see how it gets a little bit taller, but it also is, um, widening a lot, right? I'm thinning it out, but it, right now, what makes a plate, what makes a bowl, what makes a cup, what's making, these are all things that can be infinitely debated, right? Was, was the, I don't know, was, I don't know, was The Last Jedi a good movie or not a good movie? There's all these things that will be infinitely debated forever, right? Um, is this a plate? Is it a bowl? I don't know. Is it a pan? Right, it's kind of like pie pan shape. Is that a plate? Right, there's a difference. So you make whatever you want, right? Even if it's bowl like, like, because you can make something that's higher up, right? And it may be more a bowl. I'll take that because you're doing the lesson of really moving the clay. The lesson really is how to make this flat surface and move that clay out to the edge, right? So if yours ends up really tall on the border, so it's just a giant bowl, that's fine, right? 
pounds, but let's really go for it here and make it into a plate. Because the flatter I take this, the, the more risky it gets, right? So I'm gonna throw one in a little bit more. Oh, and then notice all this, there's tons of goopiness here on the rim, right? We're gonna take care of that in a minute. I wanna do maybe one more raise here. And then this rim is already thin enough, so I'm not gonna thin it out that much. All right, so that's definitely getting plate-ish, but let's, let's roll this plate down so it looks something like this, right? Where it's really a flat, pretty flat rim. Cause that's more fun. So let's do that. So I have my rib here and I'm just gonna, first of all, start scraping off this wet clay here. You see that how I just mainly did that to scrape that off. I'll do the same thing going from back here. So you notice that I took, I took this rib and I went down this way, down to there. And then I'm gonna come back with this and come this way into there. And spend time getting this curve looking good. Go. I'm spending some time making that curve look good. Oh, that's looking so much better. And then, and then I'll come back down from this side, get this side looking good. Take it easy, take it easy. Cause you don't want to go too fast. Cause the forces here are the force that as the wheel is spinning, right? It's like being on a merry-go-round. Remember when your brother or crazy bigger cousin said, get on there and I'll try to whip it around really fast. If you stay in the middle, of the merry-go-round, you're fine, right? Going around really, as you get out closer to the edge at the same speed, you wanna fly off violently, right? Same thing here, right? This is way out at the edge of the merry-go-round, so there's more force for, right? It really wants to flare out, so watch your wheel speed, take it easy, right? And then let, slowly push it down, okay? Right, so you see how I'm slowly pushing it down. Now, I have to think about what I want here. So let's say we want this sort of rim where we have a kind of a thing, it kind of turns up, but then it has a flat part that's kind of laid down, right? So you kind of want it kind of like this, where it kind of comes up and then kind of comes, let's do a lower version of this, right? So you guys could see it. Ooh, we gotta back you away, lower. Back you, uh, there we go. All right, so everything is, okay, there. So. So you see how that, so now what I need to do is start thinking about laying this down. So you notice that inside is finished, right? I finished that part. I finished kind of this curve, right? So the last thing I do is the rim. If, the, if there's any parts that are still messed up, I take care of the, those parts now. Rim is this rim, when I lay it down, is gonna make the form, the whole thing really weak. Right, and I won't be able to come back and make adjustments to the rest of it later. So I make sure that everything's looking good. So I may come back through and do one more like woo -hoo, smooth out run. I may come back and do this a little bit more. And now I'm gonna lay this, start folding this rim kind of flat. So I just take this guy and I'll push, take my, one of my fingers here and push underneath right where the bend is going to be. So oops, let's use this. One. Right, so this guy here is just like pushing back like right there, wherever I feel like it needs to be supported. So when I'm pushing this down, it just doesn't collapse instantly, right? I don't want much movement here because that's already in the right place, but I do need to push that part of the, the outside of the rim down. That makes sense. I don't want this part here traveling too much. So I kind of have my finger way underneath here supporting underneath. Right, and then I start pushing this down like that. Let's see if we can get a better camera view for this because my whole body's kind of in the way. Okay, there, ooh. Are you using the round side? Yes, oh, I am. So someone just asked, am I using round side? Yes, okay, because what have we learned that curve forms are really strong, right? So think about a Roman arch, right? They built those how long ago, those Roman bridges and aqueducts, right? Curves are really good. Flat things are not that strong unless they're going straight up and down like a pole, but flat things going horizontally are really weak, right? So if I incorporate, if I'm using this curve here and push down here, I'll have a slight bow upwards where the rim flares up. It's much, much, much stronger until I'm ready and then I'll come back with the flat side and flatten it out.
Very good observation. I totally was gonna, I totally was gonna miss that. So here, right, I'm, I'm using the round side so that there's a scoop up here, and then there's a secondary kind of scoop up here, right? And that allows me to kind of fold it down, fold it down, fold it down until it gets close. And then at the last thing I do is use the flat side and push it flat. Very good. So here I have my finger underneath. I'm not really pushing back here. What I am is it's holding its place and keeping this part from traveling downward. Right? And I'm going to push this down, push this down, push this down. Now, now the disadvantage of using, using soft clay comes about now. Because the clay is so soft, right, makes it easier to center, easier to flatten, blah, 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 everything, except for this, because it's soft and weak, this part has a tendency more to want to flop down, right? If I use kind of harder clay, this would be no problem, but this is a little bit weak right now, right? So I don't get to lay it down as much as I maybe would normally, but here I am using this part of the guy, this part of the rib and kind of walking it back in and establishing, you can tell like a line there. You guys see that right there? You guys see the line? Oop, I'm missing it right there, where this curve scoops up and then another curve starts right there. So I'm pushing this down like that. And I think that's good. Well, that's quite a rim though, right? Because you gotta watch out for how wide is this space, the the flat surface, and then how wide is the rim? Is it looking good? Right? So how do you know? how good your restaurant is. If you go to the super expensive restaurant, they have this massive rim and a little spot in the middle and they put like one asparagus and a little grated <laughs> ginger and then a, like a little piece of meat or something, right? And it's like 40 bucks. So rim, let's talk about rim. Why do you even want a rim? A rim is, it doesn't allow you necessarily to put more food on there, right? But what you think about it is a frame for your food. Right, you have food in the middle, and then you have this frame, like a picture frame, and you could use a different color. You could put decorative stuff on there. You can do some carving. You could do something on there to kind of jazz it up because this surface here, the food's gonna be covering. The food should rock, right? Whatever you're doing, right? But the rim can be a different color, can offset complementary colors, or you could do some decoration like John Hasegawa is awesome, right across the rim, right? Whatever you want, that's your space to go nuts, right? And then the food's gonna cover up this. And so putting John Hasegawa rocks isn't that ex as, as exciting, right? So that makes sense. So now I'm gonna keep laying this down, right? So you see, I just keep pushing down uh, casually. Now I'm not pushing down here. I feel like that's where it needs to be. So here I'm running my hands underneath just to kind of, I'm not really pushing back, but it allows me to feel how the rim is responding to my pressure. I will know that the rim is too weak for me to push it down. To I know when I need the rim is getting too weak when the rim starts undulating a little bit where it doesn't, where one part just starts collapsing on its own. I can't see that with my eyeballs because I'm over it, but it, I can feel it with my hand, right? And so if the rim is rock solid like it is now, it's not really bobbing up and down, but I can keep doing this and I keep laying it flat. Now, you cannot really make it completely flat because the minute it goes completely flat, it loses all its tension and just goes the other way. It's like trying to hold a rope or something flat. It just drops, right? But if it still has a slight upward turn or a slight cupping, it'd be fine if you're being good, right? So it's almost there, right? So. So there, and it still has a slight upward scoop, which is hard to see. But now what, what you're gonna do is start looking at the plate and proportion it, right? How does this surface look? How does that look? I think it looks okay. You notice that we haven't talked about cutting off the rim. If you need to cut off the rim, you wanna wait as long as you can. And so now would be the time I would do it. I'm pretty excited about how wide this is, the way it's looking, right? But if you wanted to cut it off, you would just do that, right? From the top side, you just rock, push down, just like the way, uh, let's cut it off. All right, so we're gonna cut it off just to show you. I'm gonna wet it down a little bit. So this is one of the last things you do once you get there, because why is it could be really uneven, but also this outside could be a little bit mangled up, right? It looks okay, actually. 
So here, what we're gonna do here is take my needle tool and I'm gonna push my other hand inside underneath and I'm gonna hold it like a pencil and I slowly push it into the clay as it's going around. Give it time to cut. There, I'm all the way through. I gotta wait till I go all the way around though. Then I can release it. Now, this happens a lot with plates and with all these crumbs and stuff here on the outside. So what I'll do here is I'll just do it again. That whole thing fell off, right? And I'll just do it again here really fast. See if I can collect all that garbage up with my needle tool. Nope, oh, crap. John. All right, let's see if we can do it. Yeah, it's because I was trying to do it slow. All right, there we go. So I cut it. We'll just see how that looks later. See if I can fix it. So I'm re-wetting it, and then I'm gonna take this little thing here, my chamois, and just wrap it around. Go slow. All right, so that's fixed mostly. Then I'm gonna come back here and now I'm gonna really, cause just doing all that kind of mangles up the rim a little bit and I really mangled it, right? So now I'm gonna come back with a, my um, my rib and just clean all that off, right? Cause it never looks quite right when after you do that. So also you see I switched to the flat side cause I'm flattening it now. And I'm hoping that it will work out okay. There's a lot of water on here. So you see now I now for the final smoothing I make it flat. That makes sense. And then there's only a few other things we got to do. So now I finish the interior. We'll we'll talk about how to clean up this a little bit more. So let's say this isn't completely flat. We can fix that later, right? Because bowls and cups we don't trim the inside, but this one is perfect for trimming the inside because it's so open. And we'll talk about that. You want the rim to be perfect. Trimming a rim sucks, right? Modifying this later is horrible. The other thing we got to do is get way down here and talk about how we're going to undercut this, right? This is really hard to do because you see, I kind of broke my rule, right? How big is this? It's actually really overhanging, right? So this is probably going to be long, wider than 12 inches when I'm done, but it's more fun, right? For you guys to see that. So, and you also see that it's actually bigger than the bat, right? So whenever I move this around, I gotta be careful because if it's gonna walk in, the, if it's gonna run into something, it's gonna damage the rim first. So this guy though, I wanna get underneath here and cut a, let's see here if we can get this up a little. There we go. I'm gonna stick this in here and just stick the tip of this in there like this to make an undercut. I'm not gonna, I have to be really close so I don't bash the, the top part of my rim. Let's see, can you guys even see it? There you go, you see how I did that undercut? Can you guys see it on the TV? So here we'll do it again, I just simulation. So you see how this, if I stick this in straight, that's gonna hit there, right? So I roll this guy down. You see, I, I'm gonna roll it over so it takes up less vertical space, right? And I have to be super careful because I work so hard at this, right? I'm imagining all my family at Christmas dinner, everyone eats off a of John Hasegawa plate. I'm gonna throw all the rest of the plates away. Everyone eats off handmade dishes forever, right? Last thing I have to do is wire it off. I have to be careful when I wire because normally when we wire, right, we're only wiring off for a small thing, cup, and we're like, whoop, and we're out, right? A ball, whoop, and we're out. This thing, you have to pull all the way across until you pop out clearly over the other side. Now, this is so wide that normally when I would do this, if this thing came off, I would just break my splash pan apart, take both sides off, because here, what's gonna happen is, the instinct is when your splash pan is here, as you're pulling across, you're gonna wanna pull up and get out of the way, right, of the splash pan, and then you're gonna cut off a big chunk of your plate. So what you gotta do is, I would pull the splash pan off, put the wire down, cut while the wheel's spinning slow until I pop out completely the other side, I can see the wire, right? When I'm pulling down, I'm actually pulling down below the wheel head here on both sides of the wire. So you need to make sure you're holding the wire wider than what the wheel head is a little bit, 
pop it in there way on the other side, right? Make sure you're going above the bat and I can't tell. Okay, I'm above the bat. Spin slowly, right? And then drag through while push, pulling it under tension. See that? And I keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going until I'm all the way through, right? And then I make sure I can see the wire and I pull up. The tendency is for people to start pulling up too soon and they lop off a big hunk of their bottom. That makes sense? And so that's the danger. So the other danger is when you pick this up, when it's gonna run into things on your shelf, like a lot of times you could use your bat to push the other bats out of the way. I can't with this. I have to be super conscious about the edge. Number, the last thing we gotta think about, cut off, that always gotta cut it off because it's gonna stick and it'll crack if you don't cut it off because it has a long ways to go shrinkage wise. Um, but the other thing we want to do is we want this to dry slowly, not fast. I never put my plates in the dryer box unless it's an emergency, like really like an emergency. Like if I don't get these done, I might as well not make them ever. That makes sense. So that's the only time we do it. If you got the choice, just let it dry slowly, more slowly, right? The other thing I'm gonna do is once it starts to get hard enough for me to flip over, I'm gonna find a bigger bat, flip it over, and so it can dry upside down because this surface out here will dry faster, especially, and then this rim dries really fast compared to the body. And by flipping it over, it allows the bottom side of this to dry out a little bit so I can trim it. That makes sense, everybody? So any questions about those things? We'll talk more about the flipping and the trimming in next class. So four, more than four pounds of clay, five pounds of clay, start with that soft clay, and then throw some plates, just try them out. It's easier than you think, right? Because there's no collapsing issues, right? And then just go slow when you get out to the edge, right? When your mound starts getting wider. Does that make sense, everybody? Any questions? I think we're good, okay.